Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. It was a sweltering 95 degrees on the Saturday that everything went down with my neighbor Karen. The kind of oppressive summer heat that makes you desperately crave some relief. I had been dreaming about lazy weekends lounging by my new in-ground pool ever since I had bought this gorgeous house six months ago, just immersing myself in the cool water and letting all my stresses float away. I had worked hard to be able to afford this little slice of paradise. The sparkling turquoise pool was the crown jewel that had convinced me to buy the property. I couldn't wait to put it to use all summer long. The first couple months after moving in were peaceful. I was still getting to know the neighbors, including Karen, who lived in the house to my left. She seemed friendly enough at first, a little odd and sometimes entitled acting, but nothing too bothersome. She had commented multiple times on how amazing my pool looked and how lucky I was to have it. I didn't think much of it and just politely said thanks. I assumed she was just making neighborly small talk. Trying to be generous, I even invited Karen and her husband over a few times to swim and hang out. She enthusiastically accepted each time. I hoped I was making a new local friend, though in hindsight Karen always pestered me with questions about the pool any time we interacted. How much did this set you back? she asked me once. Getting it installed must have been pricey. Another time she remarked, Is taking care of a pool a lot of work? It seems like so much maintenance. I happily answered her questions, again just thinking she was making conversation. Karen could be a little nosy and long-winded at times, but nothing had seemed too out of the ordinary yet. But that changed dramatically one fateful Saturday as the temperatures climbed into the 90s. I had left work a little early that day, hoping to take a quick dip before meeting some other friends for dinner that evening. As I pulled into my driveway, I was confused to see Karen's car parked out front. We hadn't made plans to hang out that I knew of. Maybe she just wanted to chat about something briefly? That's when I heard splashing sounds coming from the backyard. I headed through the gate to find none other than Karen swimming laps in my pool, without permission. Karen! I called out, completely shocked. What are you doing? She paused her swimming and treaded water as she looked at me. Oh, hi, she said casually. Just came over to use the pool. I was flabbergasted. I don't remember inviting you to swim today, I replied. Karen laughed as if my concerns were silly. Well, I'm the owner now, so I can use it whenever I want. Now I was really confused. What on earth are you talking about? I asked. This is my pool at my house. You can't just come use it uninvited. Karen hoisted herself out of the water and stood dripping on the pool deck. Yeah, actually I can, she said smugly, because I just bought this place from the bank, so technically it's my pool now. My eyes nearly bugged out of my head. Surely this had to be some kind of prank or bizarre mistake. Karen, that's impossible, I said firmly. I own this house and have the deed. You must be confused. No, you must be confused, she shot back. This is my property now, so I'll be taking up residence here immediately. I guess I'll be seeing a lot more of you. She gave me a little finger wave. I was absolutely floored. Karen had clearly lost her mind if she thought she owned my house. I knew there had to be some rational explanation to this insane misunderstanding. Karen, I can prove this place belongs to me, I told her, working hard to keep my voice calm. Let me just grab my paperwork and we can straighten this out. I started heading towards the house when suddenly Karen stepped directly into my path, blocking me. Uh, uh, uh Uh-uh-uh. she said, wagging her finger obnoxiously. You don't have any right to go in there. You're trespassing on private property, which I could have you arrested for. Now I was starting to get angry. I tried to sidestep around her, but she moved with me, refusing to let me pass. Karen, stop, I said firmly. You know this isn't your house. Let me get my documents so I can show you. Nope, not gonna happen, she sing-songed. You need to leave immediately before I call the police. I threw my hands up in exasperation. Clearly Karen was either seriously confused or just plain crazy. I wasn't going to argue with her anymore about this absurdity. It was time to call in reinforcements. I pulled out my phone right there in front of her. Fine, I'm calling the police, I announced. Karen's smug smile disappeared instantly. What? You can't do that, she screeched. Oh yes I can, I said as I dialed police. We're going to let the cops sort this out. The dispatcher picked up after the second ring. I quickly explained the bizarre situation happening in my backyard. The dispatcher assured me officers were on their way. Karen was absolutely fuming, her face turning red. How dare you call the police on me, she shouted. This is my property. 
I'll have you arrested for trespassing and harassment. My lawyer will tear you apart. I had to stop myself from laughing at her threats. Clearly law enforcement intervention was required here. Soon a patrol car pulled up out front with flashing lights. Two officers approached us in the backyard just as Karen was gearing up for another tirade about lawsuits. Thank goodness you're here, I said to the officers. My neighbor seems to think she owns my house now and pool. Before the cops could even speak, Karen launched into a frenzied speech about how the house was rightfully hers, and I was an unlawful trespasser who assaulted her somehow. The officers listened with bemused expressions. When Karen finally stopped to take a breath, they turned to me. Do you have any documentation to prove your ownership, ma'am? One asked. Yes, absolutely, I replied. I darted past a fuming Karen into the house and quickly returned with my deed, house title, and inspection docs from when I bought the place. The officers examined the paperwork and then looked sternly at Karen. This appears to be legitimate proof that she owns the home, not you, one said. Karen was not having it. No, this is all lies and forgery, she screeched. Arrest this woman immediately for trespassing. I'll have your badges for this. The two cops exchanged a look. I could tell they were quickly losing patience. One took a step towards Karen and said in a commanding voice, Ma'am, you need to calm down right now and vacate this property, or we will be forced to arrest you instead. That only made Karen louder and more defiant. She got right in the officer's face, jabbing her finger at him. Don't you dare threaten me! I know my rights and you have no grounds to make me leave! I'm the owner! At this point, the officers had clearly had enough of her aggressive antics. The one closest to her swiftly grabbed her arms and put them behind her back before slapping on cuffs. Hey, what are you doing? Get your hands off me! Karen screamed. Police brutality! I'll own your asses when this is over! But the cops weren't swayed. You're under arrest for trespassing and disorderly conduct, the officer stated as he began marching a struggling Karen through the backyard. She continued screaming threats and obscenities as they led her to the patrol car out front. As the car pulled away, blue and red lights flashing, I finally let out a breath I felt like I'd been holding for hours. What a relief to have Karen gone and the bizarre ordeal over with. But I had a feeling this wasn't the end of her crazy antics. I decided right then to install security cameras covering the full perimeter of my property, so there'd be video evidence if she tried something again. I also planned to look into getting a restraining order against her, if possible, just to be safe. I refused to let her deranged belief that she owned my home ruin my summer by the pool. Later that week I pressed formal trespassing charges against Karen. I wanted there to be real consequences for her unlawful behavior beyond just the night she spent in jail after the cops hauled her away. When Karen got out on bail the next day, I expected her to show up ranting and raving on my doorstep. But surprisingly, I didn't hear or see her around at all. Maybe the arrest and criminal charges had actually gotten through to her how serious this was. A few weeks went by without any Karen incidents. I started to breathe easier and was able to fully relax and enjoy my pool again. My friends came over for pool parties on the weekends, and I swam laps every evening after work. It was turning into the amazing summer I had envisioned. But of course, the calm couldn't last forever. One Saturday afternoon, as I was floating lazily on an inflatable raft, eyes closed and soaking up the sun, I heard a loud voice pierce the tranquility. What are you doing in my pool again? My eyes flew open to see none other than Karen standing at the edge of the pool, hands on her hips and glaring at me furiously. I sat upright, causing the raft to wobble. Karen, you can't be here, I shouted. Stay away from my property or I'm calling the police. She let out a shrill laugh. Oh, please, call your little cop friends again. I'd love to file a complaint against them. I quickly pulled my cell phone from a nearby table, ready to dial police if needed. Karen smirked. You really think that flimsy restraining order can stop me? This is my house and you're going to have to drag me away from here. With that, she suddenly jumped into the pool, clothes and all, causing a huge splash. I scrambled backwards, nearly falling off the raft. Karen, get out right now! I yelled, but she just started swimming around me in circles, a huge grin on her face. Make me! she taunted. I know you're scared, I'm going to take back what's rightfully mine. I dialed police and Karen's smile disappeared. Get out of my pool or you're going to jail again, I said as firmly as I could. Her eyes narrowed to slits. Oh, it is on now, she hissed. Karen swam rapidly toward me and before I could react, she had flipped my raft over, sending me toppling into the water. I came up coughing and saw her climbing out of the pool and running for the back gate. I scrambled out of the pool after her, wrapping a towel around myself. By the time the cops arrived, Karen was long gone. 
but it was clear this was far from over. I knew I had to take more drastic measures to stop her repeated harassment. After that incident, I decided to construct a tall wooden privacy fence around my entire backyard. No more easy access for unhinged Karens. I also installed state-of-the-art security cameras covering every possible entry point to my property. If Karen tried to set foot on my land again, I'd have video evidence to get her thrown back in jail for violating the restraining order. I wasn't going to let her irrational belief that she owned my home ruin my summer. Finally, I could relax again, knowing I had done everything possible to keep Karen away. Over the next few weeks, I spent endless hours sunbathing, reading books, and floating around in pure bliss. Until one day, I spotted something that made my heart stop. Karen peering over my new privacy fence, glaring at me. Even my barricade couldn't deter her. I leaped up, grabbed my phone, and yelled, You're on camera, Karen! Get out of here now! She just cackled loudly in response, saying, This isn't over, before disappearing from view again. I sighed, knowing this deranged woman would clearly never fully give up her bizarre crusade. But at least for now, my pool provided a little oasis of peace in this chaotic situation. I wouldn't let Karen's madness ruin my summer. The next one is a pro-revenge story. Senior year of high school, I was taking a plane to visit my grandma. The flight went from Baltimore to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh to Vegas, then Vegas to Boise. The flight from Baltimore was almost empty, and since I was southwest, I could choose my own seat. I selected the last row of the plane by the window, put my earbuds in, and took a nap until Pittsburgh. When the plane landed, I went to the bathroom while people were boarding. To save my spot, I left my backpack in my seat and put my jacket on the seat, then left. When I got back, I noticed that a pregnant lady was sitting in my seat, with her husband in the aisle seat, and my jacket thrown on the ground in the aisle with my backpack underneath it, containing my laptop. Kind of annoyed, I pointed out that I was previously sitting in the window seat, and asked if I could have my seat back. Can't you see that I am pregnant and need this seat? She said aggressively. Then I looked at the husband and asked if he could please scoot over and sit next to his wife. This guy looked me in the eyes and said, Sorry, but we are allowed to choose our own seats. And I chose the aisle seat. Being a high school senior, I wasn't that big of a guy, but I was still not happy to be sitting in the center seat. Realizing that this was a losing argument and I wasn't going to get any leverage over this lady, I decided to grit my teeth and bear it. I collected my stuff and moved into the middle seat. The second I sat down, the lady said, You can't have your backpack in your seat. You're going to have to find a place to put it. I'm just going to put it under my seat, I responded. Where am I going to put my feet then, she retorted. I don't know, not under my seat, I replied. Growing up, I swore more than most people and really only watched what I said when at school. Suddenly, I felt someone grab my collar. The husband pulled me inches from his face and said, Don't use that language with my wife or the baby. You will say you're sorry. I was shocked. Not only was this guy grabbing me in public, but at the time, I was only 17 and still considered a minor. But not wanting to make a big deal out of this, I gave the most half-assed I'm sorry to the woman and put my earbuds in as the flight was getting ready to take off. While taxiing, the lady kept trying to get my attention by yelling in my ear and snapping her fingers inches in front of my face before she finally pulled my earbuds out. You need to turn your electronic off during takeoff, she said. Now my dad was a pilot for 30 years, and he confirmed that electronics don't interfere with communications. It is mostly a formality, so that people pay attention to the emergency instructions. So I ignored her since we were literally less than a minute from taking off. In rage, she spammed the flight attendant button until one came. We also had to hold takeoff until this issue was resolved. The flight attendant rushed over and asked what was wrong, expecting an emergency. He won't turn off his electronics before the flight. He is trying to kill us, she exclaimed. Realizing everyone was staring at us, when the flight attendant asked me to turn it off, I obliged. After I turned it off, she started lecturing me about how she was right and I was wrong, rubbing in how the flight attendant proved her right. So the flight was in the air, and when the intercom announced that we could use electronics, I put my earbuds in and cranked up the volume. About five minutes into the flight, I felt aggravated tapping on my shoulder. I turned and looked at the woman. You need to turn that down. It's bad for the baby, she said. While I was listening to the music louder than normal, it still wasn't to the point that an unborn baby would be able to hear and understand. Shocked, I responded with no, but the second she reached for the flight attendant button, I said that I would. 
I did that trick where you turn your volume down twice and then up once, so it looks like you turned it down three times. Better? I asked. More, she responded, so I went down one more notch. And before I could put my earbuds in, she said, It is proper etiquette to talk to people you're sitting next to. I just ignored her. I sat back and tried to close my eyes, and amazingly, it worked. I fell asleep for about an hour. The flight was five hours long. When I woke up, this woman had her foot on my backpack with a laptop in it. So I adjusted my foot so that it would be uncomfortable for her to keep her feet that way. She immediately stood up, and I thought she was going to yell given her ability to overreact. But it turns out she was just getting up to go to the bathroom. She passed me and her husband when a brilliant idea popped into my head. The second she stepped into the bathroom, I got ready to get up and move my stuff over to the window seat. As I grabbed my backpack and shifted my momentum, I felt a hand grab me. I did not take into account the husband. You are not taking my wife's seat, he said. Sir, I have to warn you that you are grabbing a minor. If I feel like it at any second I could claim that you are attacking me or that you have made sexual advances on me, I responded. He let go and I moved over to the seat I had before. When she got back, she was furious, demanding that I move seats. It escalated to the point where the flight attendant came over to see what was going on. This time, she sided with me. When she asked her husband to make me move, I looked him dead in the eyes, and he went back to reading his book. She ended up sitting in the middle seat, pissed as hell. Thankfully, I moved seats because she was up and down in her seat, needing to go to the bathroom every 15 minutes. That was pretty much the rest of the flight, except for when she intercepted my bag of pretzels when the drink cart came. In response, I closed the shade to the window as we started to land at the Las Vegas airport. Once off the plane, I went to Burger King to get a drink and some food. Then I got to my next gate and found the last seat. I scarfed down my fries and burger, walked across the hall, literally ten feet from my seat, to throw away my garbage. When I turned to go back to my seat, I saw the same lady now sitting in the seat where I had my bag. She had moved it to the floor right in front of her, and then she shot me this smug grin, thinking she had won. Somewhat defeated by losing two seats to this lady, losing sleep, and my patience, it was time for action. I walked over to her to gather my things, and as I got to her, I looked her dead in the eyes, raised my right hand out, fingers spread, and hovered it right over her stomach. I looked down at my hand, and then back into her eyes. I just cursed your baby, I said straight-faced. I turned around 180 degrees, walked across the hall, and sat down on the floor, staring at her intensely. Now, I don't believe in curses, nor do I think I have the ability to place a curse, but this lady believed it. Her face was left expressionless, and she just started weeping to herself as I sat and watched. When her husband came over to see what was wrong and she told him, he instantly stormed over to me, knocked the drink out of my hand, grabbed me by the collar, and got right in my face. Listen here, you little crap! He got out before security guards grabbed the man and detained him. The FAA doesn't mess around with who they hire. One guard asked me why this guy was angry, and I said that his wife had taken my seat, and I made a comment under my breath, which upset him. The officer asked for my name and identification and saw that I was a minor. He asked if I wanted to press charges, and I told him yes, but that I also didn't want to miss- He understood and let me go then informed the Southwest Airline gate attendant to please keep track of me in case we needed more information. This meant that I got to board early, and I chose the first available seat, an aisle seat, to see if this lady would get on the plane. Since she was sitting in the same gate as my flight, she never got on the plane, and it took off. Halfway through the flight, the flight attendant asked me if I had put a curse on the baby, and I responded with, I don't know magic. Twenty minutes later, the flight attendant told me that unfortunately, I would not be able to press charges against them due to being a minor, but that they missed their flight and would have to buy a new ticket to their final destination with another airline. With five words, I cost this horrible woman and her abusive husband around $500. The next one is a malicious compliance story. My SUV was throwing error codes, so we took it to the dealership to have them look at it. They informed us that the computer just needed a reset and everything was good. We didn't believe them, so when we went to pick it up, my husband drove it around the parking lot, and just as we suspected, it was driving awfully and now making a horrible noise. So we went back inside and told them they were wrong, and to fix it properly. Several days later, they called us back to say that they had figured it out, and it was definitely fixed now. Something to do with the transfer case and a $2,000 bill later. 
We were told it was fixed, and we wouldn't have any further issues. Great, I drove it away, and I got error codes again. By this point, we were beyond frustrated because this vehicle just kept costing us money and was nothing but issues for the past year or so. So we took it to the dealership and told them we'd like to sell it. The lady evaluating it asked us if there was anything wrong with it, and I informed her that I had just picked it up from their service department earlier that day, and they told us it worked perfectly. She took the keys and went out to look at it, came back in, and asked about flashing lights and some weird things. We agreed with her and let her in on the story. We walked over to the service desk and informed them that their sales department wouldn't buy it because there was something wrong with it. So why did the service department keep telling us that there was nothing wrong with it? He turned so red and immediately went to speak with his manager. They ended up having to call the vehicle engineers to figure out how to fix it, and we only had to pay the cost for the part that would actually fix it. It had something to do with a computer component that needed replacing after the transfer case failed. I can't say for certain if it was finally fixed or not because the day I picked it up, I traded it in for a different make. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.